this video is a commitment to patient education and communication to demystify the journey that couples take through assisted reproduction such as in vitro fertilization or IVF. This video will introduce the steps that are involved and the people that support you through this process of having a very happy, successful outcome of building your family. The San Diego Fertility Center initiated 24 years ago as we saw a need of serving the infertile couples of San Diego with advanced assisted reproductive technology. We had the patient interests in mind of creating a warm, supportive environment while at the same time designing the quality standards of the laboratory and other facilities that give us quality outcomes. It has been said that it takes a village to create a child, and this is the village. It's always about a team of professionals who not only are experts at what they do, but they have the compassion, the focus, to really see everyone succeed. All new patients get to see one of the physicians here, and we have several, and we all have a very similar approach to the way that we handle both the diagnostics and then ultimately the treatment plans. So the treatment plan ultimately comes from the physician, and the physician is in charge of all aspects of, of the treatment plan, but some parts of that are going to be carried forward by members of the team. Once the treatment plan's been put together, then it's carried forward in several different parts. So it starts off with getting things coordinated from a testing perspective. That starts with the physician's personal medical assistant and nurse. And then that treatment plan is then carried forward by a combination of work with the physician and some of our uh, nurse practitioners. We are here seven days a week. Women ovulate at different times and we need to accommodate those needs. We have a schedule where the ultrasounds and blood work are done in the morning. We open at 7.30. So we have a very rapid turnover machine that will get those results to us so that we can have our patient care conference at about 1.30. Patient Care Conference is a very special event because we get everybody together who's part of this team. And that means the physicians are there, the nurse practitioners are there, the surgical center nursing staff are there, the embryologists are there, administration is there. It's a very, very well-oiled machine. And we get to, to talk over everybody's results. So the Patient Care Conference starts at 1.30 and it's usually over within an hour. And then at that point, the patients are divided up into their personal nurse practitioners. So the person who saw them that day knows what they found and how they communicated that information to the physician. We'll call them back with any changes in their plan or follow up as to the next steps. Questions come up all the time, and we appreciate those questions, and I would certainly encourage everyone to ask those questions. And those questions are either responded to immediately by the person who answers the phone or forwarded to the person who's appropriate to answer them. Usually those questions, if they're non-urgent, would be answered sometime between the, the end of the patient care conference, 2.30, and the end of the, of the workday around 5. We have a nurse on call uh, after hours every day of the week, and 90% of those questions are going to be rapidly and efficiently answered by that nurse on call. But there's a physician on call as well, so the physician backs up that nurse and is available 24 hours a day for anything that's beyond the scope of the nurse. We do encourage patients to reduce their amount of caffeine and alcohol prior to treatment. Cigarette smoking has also been shown to have a negative impact. Many women ask me if they have to stop exercising and I experience really more benefits from their continuation of exercise to reduce stress. When a couple is preparing for IVF, we need to learn some basic things about them. These are uh, parts of their diagnostic workup typically, but must include some assessment of the woman's hormonal levels. There's an FSH level, an estradiol level, thyroid screening, prolactin, anti-mullerian hormone. These are all done with a simple blood draw. We're going to want to assess that woman's uterus, and there's a uterine assessment. That can be done in several ways. Very commonly, it's an ultrasound. And then also, lastly, we want to assess the male partner, and that's done with a comprehensive semen analysis. That's an analysis that should really best be done in our center because there's some tests that the embryologists want to see the results of because it's going to be able to equip them to best make some decisions that they need to make about how they're going to put eggs and sperm together to make great embryos. These tests are ordered depending a little bit on the insurance that's involved, cash payments that are involved. If there's insurance companies, then we need to integrate with their contracted laboratories. 
If it's cash that's involved, we have some discounts that we've organized with some of these labs. So it depends on the individual circumstances, and those are something that our team will help uh, coordinate. Once these tests are back, the physician will look over them and determine if they're all normal or if there's something that needs to be addressed specifically. It may also be something that's already been known and we're just confirming. So depending upon what the test result returns would depend on the action plan, but ultimately the patient will be informed of those test results and how they might influence the plan moving forward. The ARC consult is an acronym for Assisted Reproductive Technology. It's a consultation for patients when they're ready for their IVF procedure. They have all their preliminary lab work done. They're ready for their IVF calendar. So in preparation for that, what I will do is review the physician's um, notes from his consultation with the patient. In his notes, he dictates the treatment plan that he would like for the patient. When I meet with patients for their IVF calendar, I ask them if there are any dates that they are not available. If they're traveling, if they're out of town, uh, what won't work for them, because we can work around their schedule, so it is individualized. Also, if patients request a certain physician for them to be there for both their egg retrieval and embryo transfer, we can accommodate that and manipulate their medication a few days, the birth control pills, so that they are ensured to have the physician that they want for their procedures. The treatment protocol is dictated by the physician according to the patient's uh, lab work, the patient's age, many factors, and the medications are dependent upon their protocol or it's insurance driven. When I first meet with a patient for their ART consultation, I do review their day three hormones, their TSH, the prolactin, uh, confirm that their uterine assessment is normal before we go on for an IVF calendar. They have had the results before, so I do it more as a review in preparation for their IVF calendar. Once they receive their calendar, before they leave the clinic that day, they'll make appointments for all of their ultrasounds and appointments for their injection teaching that day. During the ART consult, I will review with patients all the IVF consent forms. It's a big packet of consent forms and I go over in detail the consent for the egg retrieval for their embryo transfer. For ICSI, the intracytoplasmic sperm injection for fertilization, if that's warranted and ordered. Assisted hatching, if they're doing pre-genetic diagnosis testing, the PGD, embryo cryopreservation or, and or sperm cryopreservation. So I review all those with the patient. It's also included as a disposition of embryos. So I review that packet with them and their job is to go home, read it in detail, call us with, if they have any questions and sign it and bring it back at their baseline ultrasound before they get started on their cycle. So they're given that packet of information. In addition, they're given a list of uh, pharmacy list of all the medications that they're going to be receiving. It's a little overwhelming because it's a big page of le lots of um, medications checked on the list um, that are necessitate the whole IVF cycle. And they get a list of pharmacies that they can get the um, prescription filled if insurance doesn't cover it. They're also given a handout on um, do's and don'ts commonly asked questions and answers what happens with an IVF cycle, medication safe to take during an IVF cycle. In addition to the handouts that the patients are given, they will receive their calendar with all the dates for their ultrasound appointments, which will be approximately three to six appointments. The first medication they'll be on are birth control pills, or estrace and Provera. Those help decrease ovarian cysts and facilitate the coordination of the IVF cycle. Another medication that we ask patients to start taking is a prenatal vitamin. They can take any over-the-counter prenatal vitamin. We'd like them to take a baby aspirin, 81 milligrams. We also ask patients to take folic acid, four milligrams daily. Uh, each pill is one milligram, so they take four pills a day. And this might help prevent birth defects. Ovarian stimulation involves taking a subcutaneous injection 
It's in the tummy, it's a little insulin type syringe for approximately nine to 13 days, all depending on how patients respond. We ask that they take it between eight and 10 in the evening for approximately, like I said, nine to 13 days. The average number of eggs we retrieve is approximately 10 to 15. The possible side effects of the injections most common are some bloating, a little cramping, to lesser degree headaches, mild mood swings. The stimulated medications that the doctors prescribe include Folistim, Gonal F, Menopure, and Brevel. The Folistim, the Gonal F, and the Brevel all have pure FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. What that does is it, it helps the ovary create multiple follicles. A follicle is a fluid-filled sac that contains an egg. We also will add in a medication called Menopure. Menopure has both a combination of FSH and LH, which is luteinizing hormone. The luteinizing hormone helps to mature the egg inside that follicle. Some of the other medications that we use in conjunction with the FSH and the LH include Ganarelix, Cetratide, and Lupron. These help to keep the ovaries from prematurely ovulating. Some of the side effects that we see are headaches and hot flashes. When the doctor deems that the patient's ovaries are ready for egg retrieval, they're going to give the patient a trigger shot of HCG, which is human chorionic gonadotropin. HCG is a hormone that is given to the patient that induces ovulation and helps them to release those mature eggs. We inject the HCG approximately 36 hours before the egg retrieval. It's a subcutaneous injection. The timing on the HCG injection is so important because it causes the, the ovary to ovulate the eggs that were growing and we need to go in and retrieve those eggs before the eggs leave the ovary. During the process of doing IVF, we're likely to recommend that we might transfer more than one embryo. And when you transfer more than one embryo, there's a possibility that there may be more than one baby, multiple pregnancy. You'll be counseled about those risks and there's actually a team approach to making the decision about how many embryos we may choose to transfer back into the uterus. Could be one, could be more than one, depending upon individual circumstances. Others are complications of the ovulation induction. It's the fertility drugs that we're using that are stimulating the ovaries to make multiple eggs. And sometimes that stimulation becomes overly aggressive, what's called hyperstimulation. And that can be sometimes quite painful. Those, those hyperstimulated ovaries can become a little weepy and there's some fluid that can collect around them. Fortunately, those are very, very rare these days. There's been a lot of advances in the prevention of hyperstimulation. What used to be something that happened maybe one to 2% of the time, still small, now happens even far less than that. Last complication are really things that are still up for education and we're learning about. There's some studies that suggest a potential that there may be increased birth defects in couples that conceive using fertility treatments, other studies that suggest there's no difference from the general population. Depending upon what complication or what side effects occur, there may be some things that we might use to manage them. If a woman develops this hyperstimulation concept or this hyperstimulation complication, that fluid that I talked about previously can be tapped off to make her more comfortable. There may be some medications that can help prevent that in the first place that we might add to her treatment protocol. If there's multiple pregnancies, there's counseling that's involved in uh, the risks of carrying a multiple pregnancy, reducing a multiple pregnancy, and that's often done in conjunction with um, high-risk obstetricians. When patients are ready for their egg retrieval at the Delmar Surgery Center, they should expect to be here for approximately three hours. The procedure itself takes approximately 20 to 30 minutes in the operating room, and then they'll be in recovery approximately an hour. They will be meeting with an anesthesiologist before their egg retrieval who will start an IV. They'll meet with their physician to talk with them about any questions, concerns, and then after their egg retrieval, while they're in the recovery room, they'll meet with an embryologist. The embryologist will tell them how many eggs they've retrieved and get a contact number so that they can contact them every day with their embryo development. The transvaginal aspiration of oocytes, or TVA, is a ultrasound-guided vaginal egg retrieval. It's the same ultrasound that the patients are monitored every day, except the, there is a long needle on the top of the transducer probe. It goes in the vagina directly into the ovaries, 
and the physician has a suction foot pump that he places the needle in the follicles, the dark circles that you see um, developing on the ultrasound, and it aspirates the fluid from the follicle into the test tube. The test tube is then handed to the embryologist who has an incubator microscope. He'll empty the fluid out into the dish and count the eggs as they're being retrieved. The anesthesia used for the TVA is uh, the anesthesiologist, it's all intravenously and it's uh, propofol and fentanyl. Patients are completely asleep, won't remember anything at all, wake up in recovery room. As the patient is being monitored for the ovarian stimulation, we want abstinence two to five days before the egg retrieval. We will need a sperm sample the day of the egg retrieval. The partner can produce at home as long as he brings it in within an hour and a half or he's welcome to produce here while his uh, partner is having the egg retrieval. After the egg retrieval, the patient, it's common to have mild cramping and may have a little spotting. Patients can get more medication and recovery if needed. If not, um, Tylenol, uh, extra strength Tylenol works very well. Once they go home, in addition to the Tylenol, if they're having more cramping than the Tylenol's helping with, they can have a prescription for some Vicodin if necessary. After patients discharge from the Delmar Surgery Center, they do need someone to accompany them home because they can't work that day or they can't drive a car for 24 hours because of the anesthesia. After the egg retrieval, we ask that patients abstain from tub baths, douching, tampons, and strenuous activity. After the egg retrieval, the patient should call the Delmar Surgery Center if they have a fever greater than 101. If they have any heavy vaginal bleeding, we say saturating a pad every hour, uncontrolled abdominal pain, uncontrolled by Tylenol or their pain medication, continuous nausea, vomiting, or inability to urinate, they should call us. The nurses at Del Mar Surgery Center will also be calling each patient within 24 to 48 hours after, checking on them, asking them if they have any concerns about anything, about any questions about their medication. After the egg retrieval, when the patient's in the recovery room before they're discharged, the Delmar Surgery Center nurses will review all the medications that the patients need to be on. The patients will have been given a list of the medications when they had their trigger shot, the HCG, 36 hours before. But the medication they will be on is progesterone. It supports pregnancy and implantation. That starts the evening of the egg retrieval. That can be given either intramuscularly, it's a progesterone and oil. It can also be given as an oral tablet and a vaginal tablet. It's the patient's choice of how they would like to continue that uh, up through the first trimester of pregnancy or until their OB tells them to stop. They will also be on an antibiotic called azithromycin. Both partners need to take that to prevent any uterine infection, bacteria that can cross over from partner to partner, so we ask both partners to take that. One other medication that patients will be on is prednisone. That will start the day of the embryo transfer, and that's to prevent rejection of the embryos. After the eggs are retrieved, they're taken back into the laboratory with the embryologist. Um, the embryologist will evaluate the eggs, and then depending on the insemination plan, the eggs are either put immediately back into the incubator if they're just gonna have standard insemination, which is when the eggs and the sperm are just mixed together and they're fertilized naturally. If ICSI is being performed, when we actually inject a sperm cell into the egg, then we actually like to clean those eggs. When we clean the eggs, we look for the egg maturity. That's when we'll assess the egg maturity and we'll see how many eggs are mature. And then we'll put them back into the incubator for insemination later that afternoon. The patients are updated each day on how their embryos are doing. So the first update that they will get is usually on day one, which is fertilization check. And then they'll get a call each day after that on how their embryos are doing. What we're really looking for is trying to decide which day is the embryologist going to be able to select the best embryos for transfer. Sometimes that's sooner on day three, and sometimes we like to observe the embryos a little bit longer until day five. 
When you arrive here for your embryo transfer, you will first meet with one of the embryologists. They'll have pictures of all of your embryos, discuss the embryo quality with you, and begin the discussion of how many embryos we're planning to transfer. Then you'll get to meet with one of the doctors, go over the exact same thing, the embryo quality, and also the physician will put their input in on how many embryos they're recommending for transfer. Embryo transfers are performed under vaginal ultrasound guidance. The patient can expect to be here for about an hour and a, to an hour and a half. However, most of the time the actual embryo transfer only takes about five to 10 minutes. This whole process is dependent usually on the number of embryos a patient has as well as the quality of the embryos. Also, we take into account the patient's medical history and how many previous embryo transfers they've had in the past. So if they've had more cycles, we may recommend being more aggressive with the embryo transfer. Or if this is their first embryo transfer, we may only recommend transferring one or two embryos. After the embryo transfer, our instructions to our patients are basically to take it easy. So there, we don't instruct on bed rest, we really instruct just taking it easy, no strenuous activity, no, no running, jogging, um, high level impact or high level aerobics, no hot um, yoga, um, but mild, you know, at sedentary activity, walking, swimming is fine, light weight lifting is fine, but nothing that's going to get their core body temperature overheated. Patients receive written instructions for a pregnancy test, which will be 16 days after their egg retrieval. They'll come here to San Diego Fertility Center, have blood drawn in the morning, they'll get results that afternoon. A positive test is any beta HCG level greater than five. When the patient has a positive pregnancy test, they'll be instructed to repeat it in 48 hours, and then they will be scheduled an ultrasound two weeks after that to detect fetal heart tones. They'll continue all their medication, the progesterone, baby aspirin, folic acid, vitamins, whatever they've been taking, they will continue everything. If the patient's pregnancy test is negative, they'll be called and instructed to stop all their medication and they will have already had an appointment scheduled for a follow-up with the physician. We have many creative financial solutions and we customize our approach to each of our patients' individual needs. For our patients who do not have insurance coverage, San Diego Fertility Center has designed global cash discount cycle fees to assist those who may need more than one IVF cycle to achieve pregnancy. These programs are prepaid, the payment is due at the baseline ultrasound, discounted, and created for the patient who may need multiple cycles. For our patients with insurance coverage, rest assured that we will assist you with your pre-authorizations, claims, and benefits from beginning to end. Our success guarantee programs are a shared risk program which requires specific diagnostic criteria that must be met. The success guarantee program is defined as one fresh IVF cycle as well as all frozen embryo cycles produced as a result of the first fresh cycle. At San Diego Fertility Center, we share the same goal, a baby or we will give you a refund. In the event that you do not get pregnant with your first fresh cycle and you've exhausted all your frozen embryos, you will receive a percentage refund of your cycle fees. Our elective single embryo transfer program, also known as ESET, is a unique program which provides comfort to those not willing to risk the chance of having multiples. Our ESET success guarantee program requires specific diagnostic criteria that must be met and follows the same guidelines as our regular IVF success guarantee program. Our ESET program is defined as one fresh IVF cycle and two frozen single embryo transfers. In the event you do not get pregnant with your fresh cycle and you've completed both single embryo frozen transfers, you will continue with your frozen embryos transferring back two at a time until you've achieved pregnancy or exhausted all your frozen embryos. Payment for your IVF cycle is due in full on your baseline ultrasound. This is approximately two weeks prior to your actual retrieval. For those wishing to utilize a payment plan or need financial assistance, San Diego Fertility Center works hand-in-hand -hand with Capex MD. Capex MD is a financial company who pays the balance off in full to San Diego Fertility Center and gives you the opportunity to make monthly payments that fit your budget. This online process is very simple. You apply online and Capex MD will contact you within 24 hours with an approval. 
Should you wish to pay out of pocket, we accept all major credit cards, wire transfers, cash, and personal checks. There's professional counseling, there's synergistic Eastern medicine and Western medicine, benefits of acupuncture and massage therapy, and above all, a partner who is supportive and understanding will help everyone have their own success.